everyone. Welcome back to the STOA. Excited to see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the room today. Uh, year two of the STOA is well on its way. And uh, who better to help launch this year than Evan McMullen, our genius in residence here at the STOA. Um, for those of you who know Evan, uh, he does the, the bridge series, Rationality to Woo, uh, a few one-off sessions in a four-part series. Um, uh, back during year one of the STOA. And so when I was kind of doing uh, the event sessions for, for year two, uh, I asked Evan, um, anything that's coming to mind? And if you read the four attractors piece of the STOA, uh, one of the attractors was Stoicism Reborn, which uh, put emphasis on virtue. Uh, what is virtue? Um, it's a question that I've been pondering. Uh, I'm not really sure myself. And both Evan and I, had the, the title came to mind, The Bridge to Virtue. Uh, so we ran with that. And uh, how today's gonna go is gonna be similar to other bridge sessions. I'm gonna take Evan in a moment. He's going to share his thoughts. I imagine I'll have some questions for him. And if you have any questions, put in the chat. Uh, if you wanna be on YouTube, uh, just indicate that. And this is more, uh, this is Evan at the edge of his uh, thinking. This is sort of a speculation. So he's not coming from an epistemic authority uh, position. So if you have any kind of comments, feedbacks, in addition to questions, feel free to put those in the chat as well and just indicate that you want to uh, ask it uh, to Evan or even the group and then I'll call on you. Um, so I think I covered everything. Evan, my friend, welcome back to the STOA. Really glad to be here. Um, so glad the STOA has a year too. So thank you for that, Peter. And I'm, I'm really excited to see everybody here. Uh, lots of familiar faces, some new ones. So um, I guess I'll go ahead and just dive right into it. So like Peter mentioned, I'll go ahead and share my screen while I'm kind of giving it just a slight intro. Um, like Peter mentioned, you know, when I read the, uh, the new direction for the STOA, so to speak, the, uh, the attractors of the second year of the STOA, I, I found it really interesting that with Stoicism Reborn, Peter spent a lot of time talking about, um, oops, not share, present, um, about uh, virtue. <clears throat> and so, this is something I've been thinking a lot about um, lately myself. And uh, so, so basically going to put some thoughts out there, try and connect some notions of virtue and why we might care about virtue to some of the ideas we've talked about in the bridge so far. And um, like Peter, Peter mentioned, this is kind of on the edge. I'm very interested in what everybody here has to say, whether questions or, you know, comments, concerns, challenges, but this is a, uh, this is what's been on my mind lately. So let's go ahead and take a look. So first question that might occur to many people is, well, why talk about this at all? Isn't virtue kind of like an old fashioned kind of notion? Um, well, I think many of us have the sense that something is missing. Um, so when I talk to people about philosophy, um, I notice that uh, when we talk about our relationship to philosophy, there's something subtly or not so subtly missing from the philosophical outlooks, whether those are sort of implicit or explicit that we're raised with, taught, and that we share as a modern secular culture. Um, and so it's also true that old ideas aren't necessarily wrong ideas. Um, and so although old ideas can often be incomplete, if there's a pattern which was noticed and labeled by many different human societies across time and space, there's usually some sort of there there. And so that brings us to the idea of virtue. It's an old idea for sure, um, but might it have something to offer us? So uh, why might this way of looking at things in terms of virtues, cultivating virtue, having virtues, um, why might this have become de-emphasized and why might it make sense to take another look? So that's kind of what we're gonna be looking at today together. So um, just a brief diversion into some terminology. So for those of you that have studied philosophy, this is all basic level review, but I don't wanna leave anybody out. So there's three common broad categories of normative ethical or uh, moral frameworks. Um, deontology, uh, which um, doesn't actually derive from like deos, God, it derives from deon, which means duty in Greek. Um, so uh, deontology is a set of ethical or moral systems which basically examine acts themselves and classify them into good or bad or neutral based on some rule-based or authority-based standard of judgment. Um, virtue ethics, which is one of our main topics today, um, where something about the internal character of the actor rather than the action um, determines the ethical uh, attributes of the situation. And also virtue ethical systems tends to have the, the, the belief that character can be cultivated. 
Um, and how does this cultivation of character work? Well, usually um, there's some sort of requirement for self-knowledge or self-investigation. So this, uh, this should probably be ringing some bells for those of you who have seen the rest of the bridge sessions. Why would I be talking about this? Oh yeah, here we go, self-investigation, self-inquiry. So we'll return to this in a second. Um, consequentialism, the third major category of normative ethical frameworks, um, this evaluates acts based on their consequences and the effect or consequence of an action is used to determine whether it's good or bad. So um, utilitarianism is a sort of subtype of consequentialism for our purposes here. And of course, a note, any given ethical framework may have elements of one, two, or all three of these, uh, but these are pretty standard terms for categorizing the sort of character of an ethical system. So I'm gonna go through a kind of really brief um, and incomplete history of ethics in the West. So, we start out back in Homeric Greece, um, and the ethics of that time are really almost unrecognizable as such to most modern people. Um, it has a sense of being a sort of proto-virtue ethics, but it's even very different from virtue ethics as expounded by Plato or Aristotle. Um, there's a sort of emphasis on a feeling of like might makes right. Um, and a relative lack of emphasis on self-knowledge. And it's generally incompatible with almost all of the more recent ethical frames. So if you look at the way that the various heroes in the Iliad are praised or blamed for various actions that they take or various attributes of their character, a lot of it seems really weird. Like we're almost heaping praise on people who are borderline psychopaths. Um, so then in the Greco-Roman classical world, virtue ethics were philosophically ascendant. So um, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, um, and all of these, these schools of, of thought really emphasized the cultivation of virtue as central to a, a life well lived, to an ethical life. Um, and then so we move into the early Christian era, um, spanning say the, the late days of the Roman empire all the way through you know, uh, the early Renaissance period. And, there was a sort of hybridization of classical virtue ethics with a more deontological or rule-based approach of the Abrahamic religious tradition. So our concept of philosophy in the West was still mainly grounded in the classical authors like Plato and Aristotle. Um, so people like St. Ambrose and Thomas Aquinas uh, sort of recast the classical conceptions of virtue and the virtues into a form that was compatible with the Christian theological notions and requirements, which introduced a good amount of deontological ethics into the mix, right? You have things like the, uh, the Ten Commandments, other religious sets of rules where actions are right or wrong in and of themselves. Um, so then we kind of move forward in time. We see Kant, Immanuel Kant. And he was, of course, hugely influential. It's almost impossible to talk about philosophy these days without mentioning him. And uh, he really shifted discussions of ethics and Western philosophy towards a more fully deontological frame with the sort of duty-based, explicitly duty-based concept of the categorical imperative. And then you have what I'm kind of conceptualizing here as the utilitarian shift. So you have Bentham, John Stuart Mill, a lot of other people around that time in the 19th century or uh, 18th and 19th centuries, I should say, are arguing for consequentialist ethics, where we're evaluating um, decisions, actions, and their consequences um, based on uh, happiness. Like, uh, how, how does this either contribute to or diminish the overall level of happiness in the society, um, that sort of thing. So that kind of takes us to roughly today in terms of the sort of mainstream um, broad brush strokes. And I'm, of course, I'm just going over the entire history of Western philosophy in like two slides. So I'm leaving out a ton, but I think this does point to some important sort of like directional currents and what's, what's, what's evolved with our understanding of ethics. And so consequentialism is still pretty much the dominant frame for ethical and moral discussions of consequence in the present day. So for example, you see um, when discussing uh, policy, you see terms like QALYs, quality adjusted life years, cost benefit calculations, et cetera, they're all over our legal and political reasoning, which is where we make our decisions of consequence these days. And as a sort of meta note, there's been a noticeable tendency as the years and centuries go by to focus more on what you might more properly call meta ethical issues as opposed to the object level ethical issues in philosophy. So, what do I mean by meta ethics? I mean, questions like how can we know what is right or wrong? rather than what is right or wrong and how do we do good in the world. So here's some sort of speculations I have um, or observations about our current situation. So secular and humanistic ethical systems have gained massive mindshare over the past few to couple hundred years. Um, 
And these ethical systems have tended towards consequentialism with a little bit of deontology thrown in. And this does not seem necessary to be secular or humanistic. It just seems historically contingent to me. Um, so much so that many people, and this certainly, I fell into this category as a you know, young philosophy major in college, um, that, uh, that I read these descriptions in my philosophy books, textbooks about uh, virtue ethics and uh, deontology. And I was like, well, that's obviously wrong. That's stupid. <laughs> You know, and this is especially true for people like me, I think, raised in a sort of secular humanistic environment without the influence of an older religious or spiritual tradition um, in their upbringing. So I do want to point out this has had some pretty good effects. Um, specifically, I think that this sort of consequentialist, universalist, humanist focus has resulted in harms to people and groups being considered bad per se because of their consequences, that they're harmful, regardless of who those people are. Um, Whereas in a lot of previous ethical systems, there were sort of different categories of human who had different moral worth. And I think it's good that we've, in some sense, moved past that. So let's get back to the question at hand. Why care about virtue? What's up with this virtue thing? Well, philosophy, if you go back, is at its core, at its root, it's an inquiry into how to live well, how to live the good life, how to do good in the world. And we have to deal with the limitations inherent in the human condition. And so we've covered many of these limitations in previous bird sessions. I've summarized some of these with the label virtualism, by which I mean that, among other things, we don't have direct access to experience the real world. We have access to mental representations, a phenomenological world, which is generated by our brain in response to sensory inputs. And you can go back and check out the previous bird sessions if you miss them for exhaustive discussion of the implications of that. And also from the previous bridge sessions, um, there's some inherent problems with systematicity, with this idea that we can come up with a rational, logical, self-consistent system to describe any major aspect of the world, let alone the world itself. So we discussed this all the way back in the very first bridge session in the context of Robert Keegan's work. And we looked into, and in fact, the bridge series was inspired by David Chapman's exploration of these themes. Um, so, when we look at it, both deontological, rule-based, uh, act-based ethics and consequentialist uh, ethics seem to require some sort of complete systematization of the world in order to ground them. And this doesn't really seem possible. Also, given the sort of meta-ethical focus of recent moral philosophy, the requirement that this philosophy actually be useful to people trying to live well has been effectively relaxed. I mean, if you go and you just pick up some relatively modern recent philosophy in the area of axiology of ethics and, and moral philosophy and you start reading it I think for most of us it's going to be kind of hard to figure out how this is actually relevant to like being a good person and living an ethical life you've got all kinds of trolley problems and exotic thought experiments and cool systems but okay man but how does that help me live my life better? so we might ask well why am I talking about virtue here? What is the bridge as a sort of series uh, of concepts, a sort of unified way of looking at the world? What does this have to do with virtue? Well, an important part of the philosophies of many major virtue ethicists going all the way back to the ancient Greeks is that self-inquiry is necessary. So this is kind of the, the main connection to the previous themes of the bridge. So we are all about uh, phenomenological self-inquiry uh, with respect to what the bridge is talking about. So virtue ethics, especially in the classical Greek tradition and, and the Romans after that, emphasizes not just having good intentions and good character, but that there's a skill required to execute your good intentions, for your good character to mean anything. So in the pre-Socratic philosophers, this was often referred to as metis. Uh, and I've used this word in the previous bridge sessions. Um, and in, when you look at Plato and, and later philosophers, it's described as phronesis. And these both have a really strongly overlapping essential meaning of a sort of practical nonverbal wisdom. And uh, this has some connotations of clear seeing, both with respect to your introspection and with respect to the sort of lay of the land, situationally, what's actually happening around you. So you could summarize kind of what the bridge series has suggested so far could kind of interpret this as saying, um, we need to develop the virtue of phrenesis. So why should we care about phrenesis or metis? Well, 
real life situations are usually messy and complicated in a way that makes applying a set of ethical rules and duties impractical. So this kind of means that the deontological approach to ethics has some serious pragmatic issues in daily life. Similarly, real life situations are also embedded in an enormously complex set of interlocking living systems from the individual and their immediate surroundings all the way up to civilization and the whole earth uh, as a living system. So making any sort of consequentialist calculus, it, this is intractable. We can't actually do the consequentialist or utilitarian math to figure out what effects our actions are gonna have on the global scale. So it seems that both following the rules and making decisions which are most likely to lead to the best consequences for all concerned are practically speaking unavailable to us as methods uh, when making choices and living our lives. So what's left for us? Well, we don't really seem to intuitively be okay with just saying we can't know anything about how to be good and nor should we be okay with that in my opinion. Um, humans, and this is important, have deeply evolved senses of the sort of ways of being which are conducive to living together in societies as social primates. And it's not just humans. There's any number of interesting studies on things like fairness instincts um, and, and not just even primates, but, but all kinds of social, social animals. Um, and so this seems to be a plausible mechanism by which phrenesis or metis can operate at the ethical level. So how does this operate? By removing distortion from our perceptual processes when possible. And also by noticing the nature of the distortions that we can't remove, we can cultivate a tendency to act naturally in pro-social ways. And this sort of seems to be what Socrates is getting at when he says essentially that phrenesis is learned through self-inquiry and it's not something that can be is directly taught. And that phrenesis is basically the most important thing or virtue to learn. So um, some benefits of, of taking this sort of overall virtue ethicist based approach of cultivating phrenesis or metis and then making decisions in life on the basis of this cultivated practical wisdom, well, it can free us from what I like to call retrospective anxiety traps related to whether or not we are good people or whether we did the right thing. I mean, think about it. Like, most of us spend a lot of time ruminating over our past decisions and maybe their moral and ethical implications, even if we don't use quite those words for it. And this often takes the form of worrying about the consequences or worrying about whether something we did was inherently bad. So if one takes instead the sort of virtue ethical stance that the virtue of phrenesis is paramount, then you can take a different approach. Instead of ruminating over your past conduct, which is generally a waste of time, then you can cultivate wisdom through self-inquiry in order to be maximally effective in the situations that one actually has any control over, which is say the present and any future decisions you might make. And so we have some additional concerns and benefits. Well, we seem as a mainstream culture to have lost in many important senses, uh, the, the idea or the sense that personal cultivation, personal excellence and virtue has anything to do really with ethics and morality. And I think this is, probably related to or a consequence of the, this modern ethical advance where we assign all humans equal moral worth, which is, is mostly a good thing, right? You know, we had previous societies and previous ethical frames where we decided that some people were just inherently better or worth more than others. And so we treated them differently on that basis. And, you know, it's good that we don't do that anymore, but it's also good to remember that within our own personal lives and our own personal journeys or paths, that, that there is such a thing as excellence, there is such a thing as virtue, and this can and in fact should be cultivated. So if we return to the cultivation of phrenesis or metis as the basis of virtue and of sound ethical decision making, then this seems to offer us a way to reclaim the benefits of an emphasis on virtue without requiring us to jettison the great moral ad advance of treating humans equally. And how does that work? Well, because um, Phrenesis and metis can't, according to everybody from Socrates, Plato on, be taught or really quantified or measured in any sort of objective way. It's not, therefore, a valid basis for judging or condemning others. We can't have access to what their actual state of phrenesis or metis is. So that means it's only really useful subjectively for challenging oneself to keep growing into a more capable, excellent, virtuous person. And so, um, I'm kind of going to end the slide portion of this by talking about cultivating the competence to act well in a complex world. So 
as we observed in the first bridge session, we seem to be in a time when the problems we face are not able to be responded to unless we develop historically rare capacities, both as individuals and societies. And so in that first bridge session, we use Keegan's stage model to frame that, that topic of discussion. And now, so the current dominance of, on the one hand, religiously based deontological ethics, rules that come from religious texts, and on the other hand, secular consequentialist ethics, both of these are manifestations or reflections of an overall systematic Keegan stage four character of our society and its institutions. And yet in order to respond effectively to the demands of our time and place, we have to move beyond attachment to any particular systematic forms which guarantee completeness or optimality since no systematic forms can deliver on those promises. Um, and again, we've gone into this a lot in the previous bridge session, so I'm not re really rigorously defending that assertion right here. And then, so what's left, okay? So what's left is the cultivation of phrenesis or metis through self-enquiry, representing a sort of dialectical synthesis of the very roots of our Western philosophical tradition with our modern understandings of complexity. And then we can deploy this phrenesis, this metis in our lives in service of living with compassion and excellence. So um, the basic, takeaway from from what i've come to understand here is that we on average severely underemphasize the cultivation of practical wisdom phrenesis metis virtue the virtue that allows us to see and understand the other virtues and that that it would be good for us to as a society as individuals as small groups to re-emphasize this sort of cultivation this sort of practical lived branch of philosophy in order to deal with the crazy complex problems of the modern world. Cool. So good. Um, this is exactly where I'm at right now uh, with my thinking, Evan. So we're both at the edge here, which is great. Um, so start throwing your question in the chat. Uh, um, if you have like a statement or comment or feedback, just put maybe F, S or whatever, and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, I want me to put some questions. Um, so for Nisus, uh, or practical reasoning or, or prudence, um, as you know, is the, the first of the cardinal virtues. That's the basis of both Stoicism and Christianity. That's known as the mother of all virtues. Um, and yeah, it's like, a, and perhaps it's time to bring some of the Stoics like Massimo and Donald Robinson to the mixture at the, at the Stoa um, to discuss. But I've always felt like a longingness when I was asking them, like, how to practice phrenesis? Like, how to actually practice practical uh, reasoning? Um, and like, perhaps there's, uh, you know, how Samuel Berger has something called intellectual dark matter. Perhaps there's like a, a praxis dark matter that, you know, we need to rediscover of how to like practice uh, phrenesis. But any thoughts on that? Like, how do we actually put this to practice and body it um, to, to manifest this virtue? Yeah, so that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of respond with a bit of a story, I guess, maybe. So due to the very weird sort of scattershot um, approach that I took to my own personal practice over the past 10, 15 years, you know, it's sometimes hard for me to remember and locate which actual practices led to which actual changes. And I've talked about this before in the context of, say, psychedelics versus meditation, right? But this is just a broad general problem that I have um, in, in explaining things. And so what's interesting is, you know, um, sometimes you'll have something come up for you where you kind of remember, oh, sh wait, that oh, wow, that, yeah, I remember that. Now that was a big thing that mattered a lot to me, right? And so um, you might recall uh, from, from the first uh, season of the Stoa, um, we had uh, Michael Ashcroft on, right? And uh, he did a short little session on the Alexander Technique. So um, the Alexander Technique is something I had almost forgotten about until that session. And then until more recently, I actually decided to go ahead and sign up for his, his course on the Alexander Technique. And it's bringing back a ton of memories because I did some Alexander Technique years and years and years ago that as I'm experiencing this course that, that Michael is offering, um, 
it's coming back to me how important this stuff has been for me in my own experience of personal development and how vital it is. And so um, the reason I, I'm bringing this story up is because the Alexander Technique specifically, I think contains, and especially the way that Michael likes to present it, both in his newsletters on expanding awareness, his course if people get the chance to sign up for it, um, and somebody just mentioned in the, the chats, his Twitter is an absolutely great source for a lot of practical techniques and things on this. The way he presents the Alexander Technique focuses on creating or noticing or cultivating the space in between a stimulus and a response, right? And so I really think that this is an incredibly valuable sort of approach, whether you call it Alexander Technique or not, what like, the, the cool thing about Alexander Technique is it's essentially like a native Western tradition that doesn't have to use any of this jargon from any of the Eastern meditative traditions. This guy had trouble singing and speaking when he was a kid, FM Alexander, and he then basically through self-observation, and again, self-inquiry, self-observation, looked in the mirror while he was reciting and singing and, and noticed what was going on in his body and his awareness and developed the tools and techniques to fix it, right? And so, so it's a very like modern and kind of plain language approach to self-inquiry. And so the reason I mention that is because one, it's just been alive for me lately and I really appreciate what Michael's doing with that. But two, because I think that's one of the main keys is focusing on cultivating the space in between a stimulus and a response, right? So something happens, we experience a thing, and then how big is the space between that and the reaction, how automatic is that reaction versus how much choice do we have in the matter? And do we have the choice to allow actions to sort of suggest themselves and then to not take those actions and wait for, for a, a more, a, an action that's more in alignment with the needs of the situation and ourselves to, to occur to us, right? And so I think that, that this is sort of an essential component of, of what's being talked about when, Plato and others discuss phrenesis, right? It's, it's not primarily an intellectual form of knowing, it's practical wisdom rather than the wisdom of old people or of you know, book learning. It's, it's all about something that allows you to choose better. And so um, you know, I, was, I was talking um, recently with someone and it occurs to me that really going back in my own sort of life story, a lot of the lessons of how to practically approach the ways of living that say like, Vajrayana Buddhism, a tantric approach. Well, like, how did I actually internalize much of that? A lot of that goes back to some Alexander Technique stuff, right? And it's not by any means the only such approach, but it was the one that first popped to mind when you're saying, well, how can we cultivate or develop phrenesis? Well, these sorts of techniques that are specifically designed to increase that space between stimulus and response, I think are key to phrenesis development. Yeah, it's good. So let's say there's like an ecology of practices of phrenesis um any any sense of what that could look like um because you know journaling could be one um and uh and also adjacent to the ecology of practices what are like a minimum viable skill sets needed and just you know going back to just you know the practical reasoning reasoning how much of the syllogisms we need to know uh, uh, deductive reasoning inductive reasoning logical fallacies that obviously are applied to um the self in everyday life? Honestly, I think most people here probably know all the deductive reasoning, logical stuff they probably need to know, you know, um, given, given the sort of uh, people I've interacted with through all the different STOA events, social events, et cetera. Like we are not necessarily lacking in the uh, formal logic, the rhetoric, the, the book smarts sort of uh, aspects of things as, as a group, right? Um, and so when we talk about the ecology of practices that supports phrenesis, again, I'm going to go back to an example from the sort of Alexander technique side of things because it's, it's been on my mind and it's so instructive because um, one of the things that you notice is um, when you do this sort of training is that it's possible for one to have habitual ways of carrying oneself. And I mean this in a very embodied physical sense, right? Like your posture. A lot of people associate Alexander Technique with posture. You know, singers and actors do it to like look in charge and in command or whatever, cool. But 
why would we even need to do that? It's because we can have habitually conditioned ways of being with respect to how we carry our most basic aspect of ourselves, our physical body, which feel right to us, but which are actually wrong in the sense that they are biomechanically suboptimal. They will predictably and reliably cause pain and strain and lack of effective functioning of the human organism when iterated over time, right? And like, if you've, most people here, maybe if you've ever done like a dance thing or a martial arts thing, a Tai Chi thing, an Alexander technique, thing, anything like this, you often will have the experience of realizing that you're even like walking wrong and or sitting wrong in a way that like, and then this, this wonderful teacher who has great posture might come over and like gently help correct you. And at first it feels wrong. The right way you can see in the mirror the, the, the way that is actually like, like uh, more, more biomechanically correct, that distributes the weight better, that's gonna lead to less strain on your joints, that sort of thing can feel wrong. Like I remember um, being a really young guy and uh, a friend of mine was really into dance, had great body mechanics. And he showed me, I'd basically been walking wrong the whole time and it had collapsed the back of my spine. And I just didn't believe him at first. You know, I didn't believe him because he tried to correct my hips and it just felt wrong. And I'm like, no, nah, you're wrong, I'm good. And then, Years and years later, after going through a lot of martial arts training, a lot of different physical teachers and, and techniques, I realized, man, he was totally right. My felt sense of what was the right way to carry my body was in fact mistaken, right? And so um, I think that, that basically doing, doing this sort of, of guided inquiry into our own embodiment, right? is super useful for cultivating this skill of phrenesis of, of noticing like noticing the areas in which we assume that we know things but we don't actually know things and this again goes right back to socrates right you know like challenging our areas of certainty and what are we most certain about we're most certain about the way we are in our bodies but so much of that is subconscious so much of that is like wrongly held that it's crazy and it's an ongoing never-ending journey as far as as i'm able to tell but i really think the ecology of practices that most supports the development of this is less intellectual and more embodied. I don't want to say it's not mental because it absolutely relates to the interaction of the like the felt sense of the mind self and the felt sense of the body self and an integration between those things. Um, but 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 I have a strong intuition that we don't need to learn more about syllogisms. We don't need to learn more about rhetoric. We don't need to learn more about logical fallacies. We need to learn more about how to fine tune the truth instrument that is our embodied selves. Don't explain your philosophy, embody it. Um, so yeah, you set up the, my, my last question quite nicely. Um, when you were presenting, the, 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 the thought of aporia came to, to mind, you know, the, the unknowingness. And that's basically what started me on this journey. That's, what, that's why this sort of um, longing for virtue or for is so burning is because I don't know how to live my life. You know, this is like admitting that, that fact. And you kind of had a question, I don't know how to be good, which is, uh, you know, basically the same question. Um, and so what's your thoughts about that connection, sort of like how that's perhaps the nidus of all this? Yeah, so I mean, aporia is literally pathlessness, right? It means without a path. Um, and, and I think it's such a, it's, it's really nice to think about it in that very literal sense, right? Um, because there's, again, we, when we talk about self-inquiry, we talk about um, looking within, know thyself, any of this sort of stuff, right? Well, the first thing you notice if you try that is that you actually don't really know yourself nor do you know much of anything else. You, 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 if you really begin on the path of self-inquiry, the first thing you get is a poria. Wait, shit, I don't know what kind of critter I am. I don't know what I really value. I don't know how to live my life in a good way. And, and that is, you know, the, that's the like bedrock starting point of any sort of, of phenomenological self-inquiry or just self-inquiry in general, whether it's phenomenological or even if you do it rationally by journaling or, you know, writing to yourself, any sort of self-inquiry, I think, has to start, well, if you don't start from a base of aporia, you're going to get to aporia pretty quickly, right? Um, that's kind of, that, that's where it all comes together. And then I think that the aporia that one experiences never quite goes away. Um, and what I mean by this is, in a lot of traditions that talk about virtues, 
humility can be seen as a virtue, right? And so I think that this has to do with the virtue of, of humility, um, where we, we notice the vast degree to which we can't really know things with our mind, right? We can model things with our mind. We can imagine things with our mind. But the whole idea of knowing something with your mind starts to become a little bit shakier, a little bit less solid the more self-inquiry one engages in. And I think that provides a solid basis for the sort of praxis that I mentioned earlier, where, where phrenesis or metis is not cultivated as a primarily mental activity in the way that we conceptualize mental skills. It's, an, it's a whole being skill where it, it involves the mind and the body working together. You know, think of the elephant and the rider metaphor, right? It's, it's, it's less about um, you know, having the writer be super in charge and like, yeah, the writer knows what's up and more about like the writer gently working with the elephant, but the elephant is where it's at, you know? And, um, and so I guess, yeah, so, 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 so I think that aporia is both the starting point and the thing you continually return to. It's the thing that continually reminds you that your mind is not going to be able to grasp the answer, you know? This is present in several of the different Socratic dialogues as recorded by Plato that we can't actually get this mental handle on what virtue is, right? We can't define it satisfactorily. We can't write it down. It can't be expressed as a thought. Yet, nonetheless, it seems to exist. And so how do we appreciate it? We do so as an integrated mind-body rather than as a mind. Very cool. Um, so I can talk to you forever about this. <laughs> Let's pivot to uh, um, the chat. Uh, start throwing your questions or any statements. Uh, I'll tag in Chris first, and we're here for uh, 90 minutes in, in total. Hey, Evan, uh, thanks for doing this again. Yeah, I'm just wanting to talk about the state of philosophy at the moment um, with the rise of public intellectuals like JPP and Sam Harris and social media. It seems that academic rigorous philosophy is taking a hit in favor of practical philosophy. In other words, it means uh, people want a practical philosophy to apply to their lives, plus it's lower barrier to entry. How can we learn from the rise of the public intellectual, but also how can it be added or improved upon? And an additional question I have for you is, um, which intellectual do you think embodies virtue the most? So that's a doozy, <laughs> both, both parts. So as far as the rise of the public intellectual, I think this is actually interesting because I'm not sure I agree with the framing entirely. Like I totally see where you're coming from, but also I feel like there have been public intellectuals of this form um, across the generations, at least since we've had mass literacy, you know, you can go back and look at people like Alan Watts in the 50s and 60s, right, who were, uh, and the, although maybe ideologically different, filling a similar role to people like the, the ones you mentioned, right, um, you can go back earlier, and, and you can also see that there, there were some fairly popular public intellectuals who were doing philosophy adjacent things, um, you know, for, for, every period that I'm familiar with. So I'm not sure that I really can buy into the premise of the rise of the public intellectual being like a modern day phenomenon um, would be, be my response there. Um, I do think, however, that there are some, some really interesting dynamics going on where the boundary between the public intellectual and the academic sphere is becoming blurred in interesting ways. You know, we've had, Numerous other guests on the STOA. Um, so Adam from the side view is a good example here, but I, and I'm sure there's many, many others. I mean, Jeremy, um, you know, we could, we could go on. People who have one foot in the world of academic philosophy or, or a related discipline and one foot in the realm of being a public intellectual in the sense that the STOA might be a forum for public intellectuals to share their ideas. Um, and who will have their own YouTube channels or blogs or websites. So I think that there is a really interesting, um, you know, reconfiguration going on of the previously relatively strict separation between the serious academic intellectual and then the sort of less serious public intellectual. And I, I'm really curious to see where this goes and I don't know where it's gonna go. I have some hopes that it will revitalize the academy as well as um, perhaps 
you know, inject some some additional rigor into the uh, the public discourse. And then, as far as public intellectuals who are embodiments of virtue, I really don't have a good answer for you. And you know, the term virtue signaling gets thrown around a lot, and and it's at the root of this problem. I don't really know personally many public intellectuals to the point where I could say yes, not just on stage, not just in their books, but in their day-to-day -day existence, these people are exemplars or paragons of virtue in general or the virtue of Phronesis specifically, right? Um, so so that, that's a really hard one to answer as far as like uh, recognizable name public intellectuals, you know? Um, so I wish I had a better answer for you there. I mean, um, I guess uh, that's, that's kind of what I got though. Did you have a follow-up? <laughs> You're good, Chris. Um, and I'm friendly, friendly with a lot of public intellectuals and, you know, I'd nominate my friend John Vareki, um and Evan uh, <laughs> for uh, the virtue um, intellectual. So let's go with uh, Nathan. Nathan, you're up next. Hey, Evan. Uh, yeah, back to phrenesis a little bit. Um, so I was thinking, uh, so if it implies good judgment, what are the preconditions that give us a frame of what excellence is? It's like, where where are we drawing our, um, natural is not the right word, but I guess um, implied excellence. Like, where are we pulling that from? And then I guess um, in this, the, um, when like aporia happens, does like, where are we also drawing our sense of excellence to? Does it just dissolve? Like, are we still, um like in the pathless sense it's like um does that just dissolve i don't know that's kind of where i'm going with that so i think the question like where does this come from is in some sense coming from a place where we're analyzing this with our verbal or logical minds and i think that this you know based on everything I've said in all the bridge sessions, I don't think that this attempt to pin down really anything with our, our verbal logical minds is going to be ultimately successful. So when we talk about phrenesis, it's not necessarily about, um, so to use my virtualism frame from some of the earlier um, discussions that we've had on the bridge, basically the, the self, right, is it, the self model that exists in the phenomenological world generated by the brain as part of an overall global world model is, is not necessarily the sort of entity which is capable of, of grounding or defining virtue or good or any of these, these things, right? But I, my personal take on this is that as a social species, that, that humans as social primates have evolved at a very deep and biological level, a, 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 a built-in sense of ways to effectively coordinate. I mean, this is essentially our superpower within the biological kingdom, the animal kingdom, right? Is that we are so much better at coordination than any other animal that this is why we're the ones that took over the entire world, right? And so even though it's not something that we can necessarily render as a series of logical propositions or as axioms or something like this, there's something about our evolved being which deeply knows how to be pro-social in the same way that a cat, even if it was raised without its, its, its mama cat, is still has something deeply biologically a part of it that tells it how to hunt, right? Well, cats hunt, they stalk, they ambush. Humans are pro-social. It's very deeply at the root of what we are. And so I think that when we talk about accessing phrenesis, we're, we're essentially talking about getting in touch with that innate capacity for pro-sociality that is the hallmark of our species, if that makes sense. Any follow-up, Nathan? Yeah, uh, no, actually you answered my question about, because um, I was gonna try to expand on like what phrenesis might mean um, outside of the individual, but I think you, I think you got that. It's, um... We're not going to go in the order of the questions were, were dropped, and we might not get to everyone. Uh, I will take in Joe next. Joe Lightfoot. 
Hello, everyone. Hey, Evan, thank you for stimulating presentation. Let me just get to my question. So in a nutshell, to rediscover virtue, work on embodiment and listen to the wisdom that emerges from that space. That's what I was hearing from you. And if so, what is that wisdom? Where does it come from? And what does it imply about us? Asking the small questions. <laughs> so yeah, I mean- I know you're up to it. To tie this back to some of the previous um, questions and answers. So, so I think that there is something in the space between the stimulus and the response, right? This is, this is something, you know, not to get too crazy woo or metaphysical, but when we look at the other sorts of creatures that exist around us, we look at, we, we've had this sense since recorded history that there's something noteworthy or special or interesting about human consciousness. And now whether that's actually true, who knows, but we, we have this intuition. And so if you ask me, well, what is that noteworthy, special, interesting thing about human consciousness? The thing that occurs to me is that we have this capacity for not just having some amount of space between stimulus and response, but for actually intentionally, consciously cultivating that space and expanding it, inhabiting that space where you know, in, 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 uh, in Buddhism, we talk about spaciousness a lot, right? Um, and it's a very similar, similar concept, right? The space in between stimulus and response is just as good a, a way of describing the sense in which spaciousness is used in a lot of Buddhist traditions. And so I think that there's something especially, especially crucial about that sense of, of spaciousness. And, and so, um, I guess when we listen to the body, when we cultivate phrenesis, when we, when we cultivate this spaciousness, there's something almost magical that happens whereby we feel like, to me, this is all about what the whole Tao Te Ching is about, right? Like when you, when you read that book, especially kind of squint and read between the lines, especially if it's a great translation, like I'm partial to Ursula K. Le Guin's translation of the Tao Te Ching, but you read, you read this and I mean, there's this sense of like this paradoxical non-dual dance between being separate and being connected, being an individual and being part of a greater whole. And, and that is reflected in the conscious experience of, of this space that can be cultivated. And so I would say that by cultivating this, whatever it is to be human, this is something that's essential about it. And in some senses, it makes us more human. So move into embodiment to create spaciousness, to let virtue emerge, which feels kind of relaxing to me rather than searching for it with our intellects. We're relaxing back into it. So thank you, Evan. Um, Rachel Haywire, you had a question about the distinction of embodiment and meditation. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how they're different. I just want to hear Evan's distinction. I almost hate the word meditation, to be perfectly honest, because it is so overloaded, semantically. Like meditation could refer to so many different things. I mean, you have traditions that talk about meditation as like thinking really intensely about a given question, right? You have meditations which are designed, like say uh, mantra meditation, which is designed to have repetitive focus on a, one pointedly on a single object in your awareness to build some sort of concentration skill, which is primarily a mental skill, right? You have meditation in the sense of like, uh, I don't know, like moving meditation, like walking meditation or Tai Chi or something like that. So meditation is one of these terms that's so broad as to be almost useless. and. So when I talk about embodiment and embodiment type practices, I guess what I'm trying to get at with that is that we have this idea and it is an idea rather than a, an objective reality in the West at least that there is this thing, the mind and we are basically our minds. And this mind is somehow in control of the body in the way that a puppeteer may control a puppet. So we are our minds we have or we control a body, right? And so for, 
any number of reasons, this doesn't really map on with what we know from introspective practices. It doesn't really map on with what we know from neuroscience and biology and anatomy and physiology. It doesn't really map on with, with any of our best attempts to understand what sort of creatures we actually are. So when I talk about embodiment, I'm talking about it as a sort of rough and honestly kind of imprecise pointer at, okay, so we have a wrong conception of ourselves as being the mind, as being the thing which has thoughts, being the thinker of thoughts, the haver of opinions, the experiencer of, of limited subjective experience. And yet that is not at all the only thing that we are. It's not the main thing that we are. And it's also not the source of most of our abilities, like our ability to solve problems, our ability to accomplish things in the physical world, our ability to survive and eat and have babies. None of this is really that heavily linked to our mind per se in isolation. So it's weird that we identify with the mind. So when I talk about embodiment, as opposed to other things I'm saying, I'm kind of proposing it as a nudge, as a corrective, saying that we have this very wrong and very widely held identification with ourselves as the mind, as a thinker of thoughts. And really, in order to use the organism that we are most effectively, we have to get outside of that conception. I mean, it's like classic that, you know, scientific researchers, the people, mathematicians, who you would think of as like, oh, this is definitely the kind of activity that happens in the mind. This is mental activity. Well, like, how many breakthroughs happened? in a dream, literally, right? Like Ramanujan, or how many, um, how many insights happen in a drug trip, like the DNA helix or Carrie Mullis' discovery of PCR, or how many of, of, of these insights, like, you know, I mean, my day-to-day -day life, I'm, I'm mainly a programmer. And if I get stuck with something, the best thing to do is to go take a nap or preferably go to sleep for the entire night and then wake up. And sometimes the answer is just there, right? And so it feels weird to call that a mental process that's that where our mind is coming up with the answer when we define the mind as that thing that has conscious thoughts, that thinks in words, that has this internal dialogue. So when I talk about embodiment, I'm pointing to appreciating ourselves as an entire organism with all these different layers and the fact that the layer that we normally identify with is probably the least important part. Just to follow it up really quickly, um, what if you like thinking, what if you like philosophizing, you like talking? Um, what if you're interested in the mental landscape? Um, often people have physical disabilities or perhaps they're just not like um, super into doing embodied things. You know, they, they might wanna write or they might wanna create. Um, maybe somebody has a, a lot of pain, for, for example, and they're, they're into the mental landscape. Um, I noticed that in, the, in this culture, there seems to be a big backlash against anything that isn't um, embodiment. Um, and I see that as like counter to creative expression. Um, how, how do you feel about that? So it's a really tricky distinction here. I'm not at all, and, and so to, to say like, like I'm not trying to say that creative expression or doing the sort of philosophy that you write down in long sentences or reading works of literature or, you know, um, thinking deep thoughts. None of these things am I trying to say are bad or are not desirable, right? They're, they're part of what humans do and what humans enjoy doing, right? Um, what, what I'm sort of getting at is there's this really interesting thing, like, so if you're sitting there and writing, right, most people who write have the experience of at least sometimes there being a place where the words are coming from, but that place itself is not verbal, okay? So like, and often we find that some of our best writing happens when there's this sort of strange place that the words are coming out of, but that place is not itself made of words. It's not even describable in words, right? And, and we don't talk about that very much as, as a culture, as a society, not, not very explicitly. And so when, when I try to give pointers to embodiment and pointers to um, you know, all, the, all the other stuff I've kind of been talking about in this and the other sessions, I'm not trying to say that, that, that the mental stuff is not valuable. It's, it's great, it's wonderful, it's part of what makes us human. But I guess what I'm trying to point out is that all of that wonderful mental stuff, the, 
the art, the, the music, the, the philosophy, the words, all of that is sort of integrated with and scaffolded on the parts of ourselves that are still animals. And that by treating the parts of ourselves that are still animals as somehow other than us, we get into all kinds of trouble. And so when we talk about phrenesis or practical wisdom as leading to virtue, I think it has to do with the integration of this deeper, older, more animal aspect of ourselves. And that's kind of what I'm in some way trying to point out with the phrase emphasis on embodiment and things like that, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it does. Um, maybe it's just like the the new age, like social justice therapy culture has adopted the word and I just don't know what it means anymore. So listening to your description of embodiment is definitely different from the other people using the word embodiment. Um, you're talking about like a cognition of, you know, a doing where you're taking in your, your own, you know, virtue really. Um, where, where I've been hearing the word embodiment weaponized by like these new age, like, you know, social justice types that are just like very mean. Um, so so I, I like your definition of embodiment better. Um, I just hope that people don't conflate the two. All right, uh, so we have, we're gonna pivot to two questions on community. Um, let me just scroll up. Judith. Uh, you had a question first. Um, yes, um, thank you. So um, I'm picking up on an interesting paradox here. Virtue cannot be taught, yet it can be learned. And it's sort of an acquired skill that's based on this phenomenological self-inquiry, but it also needs to be practiced. And um, so virtue is also practiced in a community. So my question was, what do you think is the role of or the responsibility of a guide or a teacher? You talked about sort of guided inquiry. So what's the role and the responsibility of, of the guide? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So when I say it can't be taught, I think, and also when, when, when many philosophers like like Plato, for example, have said that it can't really be taught. I, I think that we got to be pretty careful about what we mean by this. And um, this means perhaps that it can't be taught in the same way that propositional facts can be taught, right? So like, I can teach somebody the formula for calculating, you know, the, the movement of an object, um, according to Newtonian mechanics and Earth's gravity or whatever. I can teach somebody to figure out how fast a ball is going to drop if it drops off of a you know, a tower or something like that. These can just be taught pretty explicitly. Um, I can teach somebody the names of animals and plants and it's like a pretty direct kind of teaching. Like it's a transfer of a propositional fact from one mind to another. And, and when we're talking about phrenesis or other virtues, it's not necessarily the sort of thing that can be neatly wrapped up and encapsulated in words and symbols and taught in that manner. Now, does that mean that there's no role for teachers or guides or people who have in some sense developed their own capacity for this to aid others in the journey? No, I don't think it means that at all. So, so I, I think it's careful, it's important to be careful when we say it can't be taught. Well, what exactly do we mean by taught? And so, you know, maybe it can be taught, but it's certainly a non-central example of teaching. It's not what immediately comes to mind when you think of teaching, which for most people is like a person up at the front of a class with like a whiteboard or a blackboard or a PowerPoint slide teaching, right? It can perhaps be, um, you know, you can be an example of it. You can embody it, embody it. And by embody it, I mean, make it a part of yourself and the way that you live and move through the world. And other people can observe that and be inspired by that. But, but it's not like you can perhaps sit down and just uh, tell people, this is how you be virtuous. This is how you develop phrenesis in words and have it just like work. So, um, so that's sort of to address the first part of what you're saying with respect to, um, to the teaching aspect. Now, the second aspect about the intersection with community, you know, so um, Peter's written before in his, uh, his substack about um, friendships of virtue, right? And I think that this is essentially part of the intersection of ideas of phrenesis and other virtues with the idea of community or social relationships, that it takes a special kind of social relationship 
to emphasize and cultivate virtue together, right? Because you have to establish a sense of trust over a significant period of time, over various sorts of interactions in order to have a friendship of virtue, right? Because these friendships are not necessarily like, you know, if we go back to the origin of this, this is from Aristotle, right? And he talks about um, friendships of happiness, right? You know, where we have, you know, the goal is just basically to feel good together. And, and friendships of virtue are different from that, right? The, the goal is to support each other in mutual growth, but that can be really, really difficult. That can be something that is not always pleasant. Like the growth maximizing thing to do for someone you're in relationship with, whether that's a romantic relationship or a platonic friendship or whatever, is not always the thing that is going to lead to the greatest amount of happiness for both of you right then, or even over the medium term. It can be hard, right? So I think that these friendships of virtue and these communities uh, founded on ideas of helping each other cultivate virtue have probably a lot more in common with what we might think of as a good marriage than they do with a standard, you know, modern day cultural friendship where it's just all about the good times. No, it's about deeply supporting each other through growth that is often ugly and, and messy. And, you know, that like they both cultivate virtue and require a certain amount of virtue in order to participate in. So yeah, there's a bit of a weird paradoxical feel to it, but that's honestly the best understanding I have of it now. Any follow-up, uh, Judith? No, I think I'm good, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, that's sort of a um, big uh, attractor of the Stoas is cultivating this virtue, uh, virtue of friendship, the friendships of virtue. There's no real institution out there <laughs> that's kind of like, you know, supporting this. Um, so I guess we have to create it. Uh, Chris, you're next. Another community-based question. Uh, am I pronouncing your name correctly? K R I S S. Going once, going twice. All right. So we might circle back to you. Um, Alex, uh, if you can go next. Sorry, I was having uh, trouble uh, unmuting myself. And uh, Peter and Evan, uh, if you could believe it, this is my very first time asking a question publicly on STOA, despite my long tenure here in the audience. Possible. <laughs> There's no way. So, thank you. I'm so, oh. um, you know, as I, as I practice uh, right relationship to life and to my relationships, uh, something that I've learned very much here at the STOA, uh, Peter, thanks to you, I see how I can come into judgment of others for not doing that. And so my question, Evan, is, uh, does the practice of phrenesis imply the development of a self-awareness that precludes narcissism? And if not, how can people avoid the trap of narcissism when cultivating phrenesis? So do you mean narcissism in the clinical sense or in the more broader sense of just being self-absorbed? Yeah, in that broader sense of having the narcissistic traits, especially of judging other people and projecting, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, so I went a tiny little bit into this, I think, in the, the presentation part, when I talked about how due to the nature of phrenesis, due to the nature of virtue in general, but with phrenesis as the first of the cardinal virtues, um, the level of virtue of someone else is not accessible to you. You don't have access to that, almost by definition, right? Because we're looking at this from a frame of virtues rather than from a frame of consequentialist ethics. Well, this action was bad because it has these bad effects. Or a deontological frame, this action is inherently bad because the rules say it's bad or because God says it's bad or whatever, right? So without a deontological or consequentialist framing, how could you possibly have access to the information that would be required to judge someone else? So therefore, anytime you're attempting to judge someone else, you end up in a state of roughly a poorian right? You're, you end up realizing, oh, wait, I have absolutely nothing to hold on to. I have no grounding in this judgment. So other people's virtue is not really the sort of thing that you have access, even in principle, to the information required to form judgments about. And so for me, at least, this doesn't mean that I go through life not judging. 
that like that would be expecting perfection, which I don't think is a human thing to to accomplish. So for me, it's more about like, okay, cultivating practical wisdom, cultivating phrenesis or metis is noticing that every bit of mental horsepower, every processing cycle that I expend judging other people is ultimately a waste of my life and my energy and my time. Okay. And so that is sort of the, the place that I come to with this is, is that one, I don't have the information Two, I couldn't possibly have the information. So therefore this is just some old conditioning that is not in the service of wisdom. Judging other people doesn't help me become more virtuous right now. I can make judgments about situations and by judgments here, I mean, I can look at situations and say, this pattern matches to things that are dangerous or that might hurt people who I love and care about or might hurt me. And so I'm going to avoid those. But you can do so in a way that is not a judgment of someone else or their character, right? Um, like I can look and say, well, this seems like you're making some bad decisions, but it's your life. So I'm going to be over here. You're going to be over there, but I'm not going to sit here judging you. And if I am, then for me, the correct response to that is to engage in some self-inquiry and say, why is this experience of judging someone else arising? And, and even though I know intellectually that this is stupid, why, why am I still doing this? And sort of get into the relationship with the sensations happening in my body and my you know energetic or subtle bodies, if you wanna parse it that way. Okay, what's arising that's leading to this experience of me judging another person's character or self? And, and that is a really fruitful place to engage in some self-inquiry. And so that's sort of like my relationship with that question, I guess you'd say. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'm curious, any kind of literature, Evan, either scientific or maybe kind of from psychology, I know positive psychology, um, Martin Seligman, or however you pronounce his last name, they did the reverse of the um, DSM. Uh, was it called um, Character and Strengths and Virtue or whatever? They had this whole manual and stuff like that. Uh, and, and perhaps that'd be a good person to invite to the STOA uh, to have this discussion. But any thoughts on the developments in positive psychology in uh, relationship to virtue? Um, yeah, so that's a complicated thing for me because positive psychology is a big, broad field. Right. And I guess like, I think that in general, modern psychological approaches, especially pop psychological approaches um, are probably too focused on happiness. Right. Um, you know, this is one of the big, uh, big sort of like when you look at the, uh, the post classical or the, the late classical schools of Greek philosophy. Right. Say you've got the Stoics and the Epicureans. Right. And I tend to fall down a little bit more on the side of say the Stoic perspective, which for me maps on pretty well to the sort of perspectives I've picked up through Buddhist and Taoist practice, which says that, you know what, like if, if you're sitting here trying to optimize for subjective experience of happiness, this is not an attainable goal and is going to not work out very well for you, right? And so for me, I feel like a lot of the positive psychology stuff that I'm familiar with at least seems to be a little too focused on how to establish and maintain positive mental states. Whereas I think the real insight is that mental states are transient. And so meaning in life doesn't come from passing mental states or experiences. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's a bit, you know, maybe that's a harsh criticism. I'm, I'm not like super deeply enmeshed in the positive psychology literature or anything, but from the more pop psychology treatments of those ideas, that's some of the impression I've gotten there is that like at least a lot of it seems to be a little bit too focused on happiness um, or positive mental states in general. Um, David Jacobs, you had a question. I'm uh, just recovering from being on mute. Um and trying to look at my question. Lots of good stuff to think about here. Um, I guess I'm wondering if I'm hearing things right. It's, it's kind of like what I've been experiencing. Um, the space that you talk about in between a stimulus 
and you're making a choice what kind of action is a really it's a it's a big wrestling match for me um i i'm i hear you uh speaking of a big open space or cultivating um space there and i'm thinking that um that over time i've developed a, an ability to trust my gut and not have to necessarily think it all the way through <laughs> I don't know if that fully represents what I asked in my question, but you might be able to uh, help me with my confusion. Well, what I'm hearing there that's interesting to me is, you know, this this idea of like thinking it through, right? The, the sort of tension between like the rational and the non-rational. Um, and I think that when we talk about this space, it's less of a deliberative space in the rational sense it's less about like thinking through the various outcomes it's less about thinking through the various consequences or the various rules or ways that we might be judged by others or by ourselves and more about um sort of letting the body mind run itself um and so what i mean by that is that you know, for somebody that's kind of as much of a nerdy intellectual in some ways as, as I am or as I come across, I'm really kind of not a fan of rational decision making, at least not in, in most of everyday life. What I mean is that I think that that the rational mind is but a small part of us and that that the entire self contains more wisdom than the rational mind. And that when we talk about cultivating this space in between stimulus and response, a big part of what we're trying to do there is allow space for the entire self, the entire being, the entire human organism to contribute to the possibilities of action there, rather than maintaining a sort of rigid control by the brain over everything else. And it, 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 the brain's the wrong word there, sorry, by, by the, uh, the part of the brain that we identify as the conscious self, okay? Because that's not the entire brain. Um, so, so it's about allowing for the sort of percolation of wisdom from all of the parts of ourselves that are not just the conscious self that talks to us in our head to inform our actions, if that makes sense. Any follow-up, David? Uh, yeah, I, I guess that that's helpful to, um, to think of it in a space of which is more embodiment, which is uh, like, actually one of the things that comes up for me is to be not less reactive because my reptilian brain tends to make some choices that are really not very good and do not reflect my higher self at all. And that's the space that I work on cultivating. And sometimes I have to do that after I make lots of mistakes. So there's, I'm not going to, anyway, I think I, I really, I don't know if anything on there you can respond to, but um, I really, uh, I'm grateful for the answers. Thank you. Well, what you were just saying then about making lots of mistakes, I think that's key, right? I mean, like this, this whole ball of wax, the whole thing of cultivating virtue has to do, I think, with the fact that we wouldn't even be talking about this if we didn't all make a lot of mistakes in very noticeable ways, noticeable to ourselves, noticeable to others, et cetera, right? And I think the, the, the sort of question that occurs then is, well, how do we respond to the fact that we will inevitably make mistakes, right? We will inevitably do things that in hindsight, in retrospect, were suboptimal. They were bad, they hurt people, they hurt ourselves, they didn't get us what we wanted. They're mistakes, right? Well then, you know, it seems like we don't have that much luck trying to think or talk ourselves into not making mistakes. It's so easy for the balance or the equilibrium of those thoughts to slip into self-recrimination on the one hand, just loops of you know, rumination and anxiety and being down on oneself or self-justification on the other hand, coming up with elaborate intellectual schemes to actually prove that like what you do is actually correct. You know, it's sort of walking a knife's edge there. And so to me, I don't see that we can walk that knife's edge very effectively by staying up here in the head all the time. I think that, you know, 
like you like you talk okay the reptile brain does this well that, that's one metaphor we could use for this but i think that you know a lot of this has to do with our conditioning right you know we are conditioned both consciously by our parents and our teachers and our peers and also unconsciously through the way that our our brain and body reacts to the situations we find ourselves in sort of randomly throughout our childhood and early life and you know it's this is like a total cliche but like often those conditioned reactions don't serve us anymore they're not they're not pro-social sometimes they're not even selfish like they like we have things that are self-defeating even if we were just ultimately rational self-interested economic agents or whatever right we still do things that aren't in our own best interest there and so to me this path of phrenesis this path of cultivating self-inquiry and self-knowledge of creating additional space between stimulus and response has to do with getting to know like the first step is getting like like socrates said getting to know ourselves right figuring out how we currently work is a prerequisite for improving the way we work and how we currently work is not something that can be grokked by the intellectual theoretical mind in its totality it's something that we have to simply allow some space and some observation at both verbal and nonverbal, you know, embodied and mental levels in order to allow that to unfold and to see the patterns and then to allow some space into those patterns. All right, um, we'll end with this question from Aaron, uh, which is gonna set up our session quite nicely tomorrow at the STOA. So Aaron, I'm gonna take you in. Evan, thanks as always for doing this. Um, Let's see, here's my question. Uh, we seem culturally confused about masculine virtue. So in your mind, what does masculine virtue look like, generally speaking? And does it have room to properly manifest in today's world? Well, that's a really interesting question because if you look at the sort of history of various takes on virtue ethics you know there's something of a disagreement um, particularly between more modern theorists and uh, more classical or ancient theorists about whether there are such a thing as gendered virtues right like so that's sort of a, a, a bone of contention among philosophers in this area now my personal intuition is that virtues are very difficult to pin down verbally and so to the extent that there are masculine virtues i don't think that that's like uh something we can generalize much about i think that it has to do just as much with the individual character and constitution as it does with the fact that an individual has a certain gender or sex or whatever right now that being said you can certainly generalize a bit and say well you know, certain ways of being in the world, certain physical traits, certain, you know, lots of things are strongly correlated with being masculine or feminine, whether, you know, whether that's gender or sex or, you know, this all gets pretty thorny pretty fast. But I think the gist of your question is, is, is really kind of, kind of getting at the fact that virtue itself has been coded masculine in our culture historically. Um, and so when we look at the way that virtues have been discussed, I mean, most philosophy has been written by men for men. Most discussion of virtue has had to do with, with men having virtues, you know, go, like we could talk about chivalry, we could talk about, you know, the ancient Greek, it's all, all about men, right? And so I do think that, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this, but I guess the way I would kind of approach that discussion is to say that I think that in general, our society right now does not really allow for the healthy expression of virtue among people of any gender. Um, but I do think that it is probably particularly hard hitting for men. Um, and, and this is partially my own experience and partially my experience talking to lots of other people who identify as men in, in my life and in our society that, you know, there is a sense in which virtue and the cultivation of virtue and the cultivation of phrenesis as a cardinal virtue tends to lead you a little bit away, I think, from um, social conformity. Um, and, and what I mean by this is that our society, at least the society that I have experienced, my own personal experience of society, um, is that 
that our society is not particularly concerned with virtue at all, right? And our society is is not really very interested in talking about virtue. I mean, our, our ethics are mainly consequentialist with a little bit of rule-based deontology thrown on top. And it, it, it's, it's almost taboo to talk about somebody as being virtuous or having unusual virtue or to talk about one's personal cultivation of virtue. Like you start talking about it and people start giving you the shady eye, like, wait, is this guy like alt-right or something, you know? And so it's like, I mean, I think that there's an overall reframing of, of, of our relationship to ethics that I'm hoping to help start the conversation with or contribute, and I'm not starting anything, to contribute to the conversation with here, you know, in, in this conversation, talking about the importance of virtue and about how these other approaches to ethics may be interesting in terms of doing meta ethics, in terms of doing academic philosophy, but are probably ultimately dead ends when we're trying to figure out how to live our lives better to be better people, to be more fully expressed human beings and to be more pro-social. And so I think that, you know, right now, all of this is pretty messed up in society. And I, I do kind of think that in the current historical moment within our cultural context, that in some ways this is especially messed up for men and the way that men tend to relate to virtue, right? Especially given that perhaps typically male deviations from virtue may be viewed more harshly than other non-gender deviations from virtue, if that makes sense. Any uh, follow-up, Arn? Um, depends how much time I can eat up. Um, <laughs> if you want to end it soon, then no. But if you want another possible, you know, six minute, uh, <laughs> question then yeah another question what do you think evan yeah evan wants it so Let's go um ahead. so uh maybe i'm misinterpreting you but it, it sounds to me like you're saying in some ways that um the notion of virtue is masculine to begin with no what i'm saying is that i don't think that virtue insofar as it is an actual real thing is masculine, but I think that historically the discussions of virtue um, and the philosophies surrounding virtue have been masculine coded and have emphasized the male manifestations of virtue uh, because of historically contingent facts, if that makes sense. Do you feel like in some ways a kind of dissent or uh, deconstruction of masculinity? in our culture has also been correlated to the deconstruction of virtue. Do you think they're kind of going together? Whereas like sort of like masculine order in the West is maybe being deconstructed. Therefore virtue is also being deconstructed. And that's why we are left with a virtuousness culture or what do you think about that? You know, I'm really not sure. I mean, I, can, I certainly can see that those two trends have co coincided historically, right? And I mean, if you just look at the root of the word, right, virtue, well, it comes from the Latin word for man, right, <laughs> or hero, um, but a male hero. So, I mean, this is a, these have been historically tied, again, because of the way our species has evolved and, and, and so on and so forth. And I mean, so, so definitely there's a historical tie between virtue and masculinity. But I guess, you know, I'm sort of seeing this as a bit of a dialectic, right? Where, whereby I think that personally, I think that the link between masculinity and virtue is the part of the historical um, conception of virtue, which will be reevaluated in light of historical dialectic. I think that we will retain the concept of virtue and that virtue will still be meaningful. And, and in fact, very important. And yet, that virtue will be far less male coded if it is genuine virtue in our discussion. Like there's nothing particularly male about phronesis as a cardinal virtue, for example, right? Now, I also think though that, you know, there, there's, there's a much greater need for individuation in the service of the collective and collectivity allowing space for individuation than our culture has been able to find a stable equi equilibrium with. And so part of the current historical moment seems to be this, like we're in the middle of that dialectic process, right? Where like the old and the new are sort of like 
crashing into each other and, you know, fighting or mating or both or whatever, you know, however you want to conceptualize a metaphor for dialectic. And so I think that, you know, that, that, that there is something essential about, um, like virtue may be a pretty generic thing. Uh, phrenesis may, as a cardinal virtue may be a pretty generic thing and a pretty non-gendered thing. But I think that as we apply that in our own lives and our own expression in the world, that it becomes increasingly particular. It becomes increasingly unique to the individual and the circumstances um, who, who is doing this process. And I think that, that in order for us to have sane and accurate conversations about virtue, um, going forward in our society, it, it has to be acceptable to talk about sort of how virtue expresses for groups of, of men, how virtue expresses for groups of women, how virtue expresses for different identity groups in general, right? And so I think there is perhaps a bit of a cultural taboo surrounded by uh, or is surrounding the aspect of like men's, men talking about virtue with other men. And I think that is a damaging and dangerous cultural taboo that's a bit of a current like a bit of an overreaction in our current cultural moment to how male coded virtue was in the past so hopefully we get over that taboo and we also get over the historically male coding of virtue yeah that's, right on. that's awesome um so evan uh we're almost at the bottom of the hour so i'll take you in for any kind of closing thoughts and maybe um if anyone wants to have some post sense making where they can uh, go next so um, it's, uh, it's been great to be back. Um, I've loved the question. The, the, the questions are always great questions, comments, statements. You know, um, everybody here always keeps us on our toes. Anyone who's uh, presented at the SOA knows that. So uh, again, thanks to everyone for the, uh, the great quality discussion. And um, I think we'll be doing a bit of a post-session kind of uh, discussion if people want to join on Clubhouse. So I think, Chris D., did you post that or um, I'm not sure uh, how, I, I'm a total clubhouse, clubhouse noob, but that seems to be happening. So uh, hope you can follow me on clubhouse at Nomic Perfect or follow Christy and we should be able to, uh, you should be able to see where we're at uh, via that method. Cool. And, and Chris will probably set it up and ping everyone um, that he knows. So you just go on clubhouse and find us there. Um, yeah, so Evan, thanks so much, my friend for coming back to the STOA. Uh, good to have the bridge back. Um, and I'm sure we'll have more sessions with Evan at the Bridge and on the theme of virtue. Um, I'm, I'm thinking just already of all these people to bring in to discuss this from various different angles. So that's super cool. Uh, sessions. Um, so tomorrow we have a session that could be relevant to, especially what uh, Aaron's question. Uh, we have another Stealing the Culture with Dialogos on being a man. Uh, and this is going to be quite an interesting session because we have Jack Donovan, uh, Ola Berg, uh, Cadell Last, and Nina Power. And so these these four people would never talk to each other anywhere else except the STOA. So it's really a cool meta-modern kind of a conversation. Um, so come there uh, if you're interested. It's going to be a Patreon event. Uh, that's 12 p.m. Eastern time. A uh, bunch of events on the STOA. I just posted four new ones today. Uh, Adam, I'll mention one that's going to be quite cool. Adam Robert from The Side View. We're going to have a writing meditation session. So we're just basically going to write together. Adam and I are writing something, an article on the STOA as a concept, not as this current manifestation. And so we're going to write about that article on that session. So if you have any writing projects that you want to get done and you want to have some kind of accountability together, we might listen to some cool music and stuff. Feel free to plug into that. Uh, so that being said, Evan, everyone, thank you for coming to the STOA today.